Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, and this is podcast number eight. This show will air on December 8th, 2016, and something exciting has happened to me. My rent is actually going to go down $400. As most of you Seattleites know, there's no rent control in Seattle, and landlords can raise the rent really high if they want, and uh, some people do make a lot of money in the Seattle area, and some of us are lower income. So I don't want to share the details, but let's just say that I was on a waiting list, and I am fortunate that my landlord is very cooperative and a very nice humanitarian type of a guy, and he went on this path with me. And so to make a long story short, my rent is going to go down by $400. And I have a, a car, a little tiny uh, fuel efficient car that I purchased and got a car loan for part of it and put a down payment on the rest of it. And my car payments are almost done. So I've been paying about $120 a month for, for almost five years now. So I think in about five or six months, my car will be paid off. So my, my basically my, my monthly expenses are going to go down by $520. So I think one of the topics that I want to talk about based on this money thing that I'm talking about right now is how to budget yourself, how I budget myself. I can't really give advice to anyone else, but I will say that I have, have done tremendously with my life being a low income person. I didn't even realize how good I was at being a low income person and surviving pretty well until recently. I just realized that it's true that I don't really have a very active personal life and I put most of my time and energy into being a full time freelance money maker, although I'm still considered low income by mainstream USA standards in terms of how much I make per month. So my rent is now only going to be about a third of my income, which is what it probably should be for most people. So like if I made $9,000 a month, I could afford $3,000 a month for rent. But since I probably only make about $1,500 or $1,800 at the most, probably an average of $1,500 a month, you know, my rent probably should be about a third of that. So basically... I have gone to Europe a bunch of times, not to sound like I'm braggy, <clears throat> but I want to say I shop in thrift stores and I rarely eat out. And there's just a lot of different things I do to sort of um, survive and thrive on low income. And in fact, in the United States of America, it's actually one survival strategy that I believe in is if you're extremely wealthy, then you're probably going to be fine in the United States. And if you're low income like me, you're probably going to be okay. If I made a little bit more money than what I make right now, my health care costs would go way up because they don't really have sliding care, sliding scale health care in this country, as well as my student loan situation would not be good. So basically, ironically or sadly or something, <laughs> Being low income seems like it's easier to survive than if you're middle class. So if you're extremely low income or extremely high income, in other words, you're more okay than if you're in the middle. So it's in my best interest actually to stay kind of low down in the lower income bracket. So yeah, so what was I going to say? And then the other topic I wanted to talk about is my self-esteem my own personal psyche and my social life and my lack thereof a social life, I realize that I'm not really very close to very many people. And I'm not saying this to put myself down or be self-destructive or self-hating because sometimes I do feel um, self-hatred and self-destructionness, but I'm just acknowledging how uncomfortable I am actually around people and how I realize that I'm, a, I'm really kind of fake I mean, I'm kind and, and polite and considerate, and that's not fake, but I basically hide who I really am. And I don't know, maybe this is part of being an artist, part of being a performer type person, part of being sort of an introverted, extroverted performer type person that I am. 
I don't know, but when I'm around other people, I kind of feel like my job is to be nice and polite and not really get in the way and just be helpful and cooperative. And then when I want to be my real self and let it all hang out, then I go off by myself and like record my voice like I am right now or do my artwork. I guess when I ride in the World Naked Bike Ride, I feel like I'm being my real self out there with those people you know, free spirited and all that jazz and colorful. When I dress in really colorful clothes, I guess I'm being my real self. But a lot of people that I work with as a model, they don't know that I do a podcast. They don't know that I, maybe they don't realize how flamboyant my art is. Uh, Some people think of me as, you know, I'm a model, but I don't know how many of them really know that I'm my own kind of artist in my own way. Um, and some of my work I think is really, really good, good enough to be in, in fancy art galleries. Although I've never really tried to get into juried art galleries. I probably could. My mom urges me to, she has done that. She does really high quality artwork and she's a private person. So I won't say a whole lot, but I'm, I'm happy that I was raised by an artist and, uh, but I need to focus on my own self-esteem, my own artwork, my own, even though as a spiritual person, I realize we're all connected and we're kind of all one in this universe. And at the same time, there's unity and diversity and that each person is a unique snowflake, literally unique fingerprints, literally unique brain pattern, unique, um, even heartbeats. I model sometimes for medical students and they tell me that every single human being's heartbeat sounds a little bit different, a little bit unique, even though there's a certain rhythm to the heart and different valves that they listen to when they check my heart. There's kind of a lub dub, lub dub kind of a sound, but they say everyone's heart sounds just a little bit unique. So I was kind of touched by that. And so I want to talk this week about money and budgets and how to be a creative freelance person on a budget and survive and do fun things in your life and not feel like living low income is is so horrible and uh, not thinking that you have to chase money like your ultimate goal should be I'm going to make a lot of money and then I'm going to have fun and go on vacation. No, you can actually have fun and go on vacation now as a low income person. And what else? And how actually staying low income is a bit of a survival strategy in this in this country, at least. Um, and self-esteem and, and being yourself and feeling um, if you're your authentic self, maybe nobody will like me. That kind of a feeling or feeling like I'm the weird one. I'm the different one. Right now, actually, I'm going to go to this therapy support group slash class that I signed up for that I get free, free access to. And I feel like the strange one because I'm the only one in the room that's not on medication and I don't, I don't take any medication. I do have a challenge with um, anxiety and depression and OCD and just lots of worrying and lots of habits that I have that are, are uh, stressful for me mentally and psychologically. And yet I have uh, come up with survival strategies and coping with that with meditation exercise, massage, my artwork, my job as a model. So all of those things help me feel more secure, more stable, more structure in my life helps me feel more stable. And other people in the group that I belong to are on medications and they see psychiatrists as well as a therapist. I do have a therapist, but not a psychiatrist. I have spoken with psychiatrists. Uh, I have been on medications for anxiety and depression, but I've never been on a mood stabilizing medication. I'm actually quite afraid to take a mood stabilizing medication. So I think I, I like to say meditation, not medication for me. I'm not judging other people for being on medications for mental mood issues or any kind of medication really for any physical issue. But for me, right now, I'm 48, it feels better to try to think of myself, my mood swings as storm clouds in the sky that are constantly blowing around and changing. And if I can remember that, my thoughts and feelings that keep changing and changing and changing every five minutes or every hour or every day, because I have very, very quick mood swings that shuffle through me very quickly, very stormy and quick. So I don't have days at a time where I'm depressed and days at a time where I'm euphoric. I have throughout a day ups and downs. 
and moods that change based on thoughts, based on uh, physical events that happen in the external world, based on inner and outer events, basically, with myself and with the world at large. So if I meditate and I practice on observing and knowing that there's the witness, there's some kind of spiritual soul part of me that's always okay, that's like the clear sky. So there's part of me, maybe my higher self or my soul or my subconscious or whatever you want to call it, that's always okay, that's always calm. Maybe that's the part of me that's in tune with God. I don't know if you want to call it God or Great Spirit or just consciousness or stillness or the stability in the universe that holds everything together, the silence, the void, whatever you want to call it. You know, the middle way, the Siddhartha, the equanimous level of reality. There's part of me that's always okay. And that's like the blue sky. And then the part of me that has moods, that has different emotions, or I'm really tired, or I'm really hyper, or I'm just really grumpy, or I'm really happy, or just whatever emotions up and down, whatever they are, and feelings and thoughts. Those constantly change and you can't really, there's no stability in all of that. So it's best to be a little detached from that and observe it and realize there's part of me that's observing it that's okay, that's not all freaked out, not like really emotional. Like even if I'm really happy, sometimes that can feel uncomfortable because it's kind of like a roller coaster going up and down. So basically there's stability. See, I feel like the idea of going on medication to try to control my moods or stabilize my moods is upsetting to me in itself because then it's like I'm at war with my brain and I'm trying to fight my brain and control my brain and I just don't think that would work for me and plus I worry about what it would do to my liver so some of these medications do have dangerous side effects and so that's why I don't take any medication um, I take ashwagandha herb sometimes I don't smoke marijuana I don't really drink alcohol um, I don't smoke cigarettes. So I do take spirulina, which is a, a blue-green algae supplement for vitamins and minerals. And I do take vitamin D. And every once in a while, I have a multivitamin or a probiotic and a prebiotic. But I am generally just eat healthy and exercise and meditate and do artwork and listen to music. And I would like to get more massages now that my monthly expenses are going down because my rent, again, is going down by $400, which is absolutely amazing. It's a miracle, and I'm proud of myself for jumping through hoops and filling out forms and being patient and trusting the process, and it's worked out. So my monthly expenses are going to go down, so hopefully I can afford to get more massages because massages really help me mentally and physically feel better. I also have a lot of tension in my back. Being a figure model is difficult work, and I hold a lot of emotional anxiety and tension in my upper shoulder and neck area. Maybe see a chiropractor as well and get my neck readjusted in my upper back. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And then I'll talk more later on in the show. i got to dash off now. I'm going to talk more later about my, my psyche, my social... Um, my friendship life, my personal life, my social life, and some insights I'm having about me feeling uncomfortable around other people in terms of like being close friends with people. I work well with people as a model for artists and medical students, uh, but I don't really, and I have a good relationship like with my landlord and, you know, like I go to the bank and I'm very, you know, friendly with the ba people that work at the bank. I mean, you know, I'm a friendly person, kind of quiet and friendly. But I'm not really close to very many people, and I think very few people know the real me, which is funny because I share so much online, and maybe I'm just like an artist, performer, introvert kind of person that likes to share in this way. So I'd like to know, or am I wounded? Am I wounded and I avoid having a social life and I'm just more comfortable sharing online because I really want to express myself, and with other people I don't feel as free to express myself? Or is it that I'm a performer? So see, maybe it's a little bit of both. Maybe it's partly that I'm wounded and I avoid being close to people as a friend. But maybe it's also my nature to want to, like when I was a little girl, I had an imaginary audience. I didn't have imaginary friends as much as I had imaginary audiences. So there's part of me that wanted to just kind of be in my own world and do something creative and and share it with an audience, with anyone who wants to listen. Basically, the audience is you 
anyone who is getting something out of listening to me. Um, but I also think I'm getting something out of it myself. Just recording my voice is kind of helping me feel more stable, more secure, more calm. So I highly recommend recording your own voice if you have any desire to. I know some people don't like the sound of their own voices. I actually do enjoy recording myself. I, I feel like it calms me down to record my voice. So thank you for listening. This is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. ShannonKringen.com is my main website, and I'm on a bunch of different social media websites. I love to share photos and poetry and music and just interesting various things, drawings and paintings of, of me that other, art, other wonderful, talented artists have painted me and drawn me over the years, been figure modeling for 24 years in Seattle, so there's thousands and thousands of drawings and paintings of me which I am happy to be part of that creative process as the model. And I earn a living doing that full time and I'm really grateful. So I got to go now and I'm going to continue this monologue a little bit later and I might throw in some poetry and music later on. I'm going to surprise you. Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, podcast, radio. Thanks for tuning in. Chew under neon, yellow hat window, lit up neon, needle works, stepping shadow, faded construct, cross wire, construct no lies, shadow on red walk, happy fingers, happy hydrant me, open feet, rust in sunlight, open needle, mountain taxi, Triple hands, perfect distortion painted with reflections, hood reflects through transparent goblets in the silver waving chrome. Genie bottle, oh, collect dinosaur foam, spring break, Luna Park. Cafe water dance in the river, reflection on the water. I see warm sunset, you drop into me, green hammock calling me, freely branching little pink-feeted rat, monkey brain trap, snow cycle, snow smile. Is this a blank stare? Mirrors can only teach so much, she sits on the rock of paradox. Gray on gray, gray on gray, pondering, walking shadow, puddle reflection, strutting pink and green. Hippies use the side door, rust nose. Is the sky blue, you say, spinning over the freeway, shoes and leaf? Stella shadows, Shannon, off the curb to leaf, winter's color, fire. Amber shadows, the dance continues. Quality decay, quality decay. So I call that poem uh, Quality Decay 2. And uh, I listened to that. I recorded that a while back. And I'm listening to it. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring. You're listening to Goddess Kring Radio podcast number eight, December 8th, or yeah, December 8th or 9th. It's December 8th, 2016, and uh, I wrote that poem kind of randomly with Flickr photo titles. That's like a random mix. I, I just glanced at my Flickr photo stream, and some of the titles of my photos are in that poem, and then I made up rhymes sort of on the spot, improvisational. So that's how I created that, and then added a layer effect to that. So I am happy and happy, 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 happy to be alive. And I have to acknowledge and admit that I am struggling right now with a lot of anxiety. I have a lot of tension in my upper back. I'm in a particular mood right now. I feel kind of sad. I have been working seven days a week, literally, and that is my choice. I don't have to work as much as I do. But I have a really, really, really strong fear of scarcity. I like to say fear of scarcity, scare of fiercity in our fair city. 
So I work a lot partly because I like the structure and it helps me feel more stable. And I like to be able to save a little bit of money because as a full-time freelance person, my income kind of goes up and down. And so I kind of feel like I need to say yes to every job that comes my way. I seek out modeling jobs with medical schools as well as art schools. And I have also delivered groceries a little bit here and there, although I find that very stressful. But I kind of like being helpful to other people. And I was going to say I'm a little bit sad because tonight I was maybe going to RSVP for this free Seattle Artist Trust mentorship thing that uh, Thingy McJagger that was happening. And I didn't do it in time. And it's like full and the timing didn't work out anyway because I had to sign a new lease with my landlord to make a long story short. And so I have mixed feelings about missing out on the meeting. It's like a mentorship meeting because one thing I struggle with is I'm wondering, and I'm in therapy right now, uh, I'm wondering how much of my desire to have solitude and be alone is my true nature and that I just don't accept myself and I think I should be different and how much of it is a wound. So I would like to know who the real me is. Do I actually want to get out there? And because the thing is, I'm a very talented designer. I do really interesting compositions. I do unique abstract art. If you go to shannonkringen.com slash, I think it's designs or Kring designs. I do a lot of abstract pastel drawings and I've had them printed onto bags and I've painted shoes for many years. I have a background in graphic design. You know, I do have some talent with design and color and composition. I'm a very good photographer. I mean, I'm a very unique compositional photographer. And I think some of my work is professional and worthy enough to be in a gallery and, you know, like a serious juried show type gallery and I used to show for many years in Seattle at a place called Art Not Terminal lots of nice people there and that was a non-juried gallery where you pay like a few dollars a month and you get to hang your work and then you volunteer and it's kind of like a cooperative and I was I was called to be featured artist twice and I got to fill up the entire front room with my art but I've never actually been uh, shown really in a non in a juried gallery where they jury you in. But I'm not really sure if I'm cut out for that in terms of psychological, uh, my ego, my self-esteem. Like I know that my work is good. I know that I'm talented. I'm unique. I have something to say in my work. Uh, but I'm not really a fan of the pretentious, competitive, super, super serious fine art scene and I am kind of like a workaholic in terms of, you know, I, I grew up with um, a single mother raising me, saw my dad on the weekends, and I witnessed uh, my mother struggling financially because she's not a real commercial, you know, person in terms of her art, although her work is really, really good. Basically, to make a long story short, I just witnessed family members um, struggling financially and thought, okay, well, I'm not going to try to make art for a living. So I'm just going to be a graphic designer. But the thing is to make money, I was never really into being a graphic designer and making money in that way. So I did graduate from a graphic design program after high school, but then I didn't really want to pursue that. So I, but I do use my design skills to this day in all the different artwork that I do mostly photography, but I also use it actually even in my figure modeling. I think I use my design skills because I I studied art history and composition. And when I pose, I kind of feel like I'm trying to create a good composition, you know, with my own body. So basically what I'm saying is I create, okay, I might have to edit this later. Okay, here we go. So, yeah, so I have a background in design and I have found that I have uh, been more financially stable and made better money as a model for other artists than I have in trying to sell my own work. And also I used to take figure drawing classes and I really had no desire to draw the figure. I don't really have 
uh, the desire or the patience to measure and draw realistically. So, and yet I wanted to be the model. I thought, well, it might be fun to be the model and have people draw and paint me and see really cool artwork made in my likeness or even abstract distorted work that's different than me, but inspired by me posing. And so I have to say, I really do have fun uh, posing for artists and getting paid and seeing the art that's made and happy that I'm part of that process. Uh, but I will acknowledge that there's part of me that feels frustrated and angry that my own art is not more a part of my life. Um, and so I wonder how, how mentally ill am I? Like, am I actually mentally ill or am I just putting myself down when I say that? But I know that I have tremendous amount of anxiety and I don't take any medication for that. I take an ashwagandha herb and I try to meditate and exercise. And in fact, if I don't exercise every day, I feel really grumpy and kind of angry and I don't sleep as well. So I noticed that here I am rambling again, I'm doing an improvisational monologue. So I'm wondering how much of my desire to be by myself is just this normal desire for solitude and my introverted nature, and how much of this is just me having social anxiety and being afraid of other people. And I'm a little bit sad that I'm missing out on the Artist Trust Mentorship Night that was free and I could, you know, I, I published, I self-published a book called Art, Identity, and the Sacred, which I read from, I think, last week. And I'm proud of that book. And it's like 120 or 140 pages. And uh, it's, if you, if you just Google Art, Identity, and the Sacred by Shannon Kringen, you can find it. I published it with blurb.com. And you can look at a free sample online. And um um, I, I'm, I love my book and I, I kind of want to do another book. I have, um, several hundred pictures that I've published since, since I published that book. And part of me wants to, part of me thinks it's an ego trip basically to, to be an artist and put your art out there and, and try to be successful. And part of me thinks my art is a form of self therapy and self validation, but I don't want to. Uh, be derogatory about my art. I think that I do have talent. And so I'm basically thinking, okay, here I am sitting in my apartment recording my voice, wondering how much of, of my desire to be by myself is just normal and healthy for me. And that my problem is that I don't accept myself as I am. And I think I should be different. And how much of this is a wound and that I do have social anxiety and I am avoiding I call it a void dance, the dance of the void, avoidance. So there's this self-abandonment got me stranded again, polluted and uprooted. And so it's kind of like if I abandon myself, then I'm confused. Because apparently one of my psychological issues is that I might have a tendency towards borderline personality disorder, but I don't really want to label myself and put myself down. But basically what that is, I'm a very high functioning, if I am in that category, I'm very high functioning, like I work full time, but I do kind of struggle with part of why I like to take so many self portraits is because I'm always trying to validate myself. I'm trying to figure out that I'm valid and I am kind of shy and a little uncomfortable with other people at times. And part of why I love doing self-portraits is because I'm not shy with myself. When I am alone and I photograph myself, I feel a sense of freedom. I feel a sense of uh, liberation of, oh, what a relief it is to not be shy and not worry about what the other person thinks of me because it's just me with me. It's just me and my camera. And then I get to be the, the photographer and the model and sort of direct myself and create a sort of cinematic scene and express myself emotionally. So I have a website, shannonkringen.com, and I have my photos on Flickr. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter and I have a YouTube channel with a bunch of videos. And this podcast actually is available on Hollow Earth Radio. Thank you, Hollow Earth Radio, for inviting me to do this as well as Mixcloud and Bandcamp and Patreon, which I offer free for the public, as well as, what's the other website? Um, I put these uh, podcasts on YouTube, 
with my visual art as a slideshow. So YouTube, Patreon, Mixcloud, Bandcamp, and Hollow Earth Radio. I think those are all the websites that has this podcast. I archive it every week. So it's on, it comes out every Thursday right now. This is December 8th, 2016. So I'm Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, and I encourage you to follow your bliss, follow your dreams. If you want to do a podcast, all you need is a microphone, a high-speed internet connection, and a microphone, yeah, a microphone, (laughs) sorry, high-speed internet connection, and sign up for like Mixcloud or Bandcamp or something like that, or just a YouTube channel, and just record yourself and learn how to edit and then share it with people and promote it. So I got into this because I did a public access show called Goddess Kring, uh, and I used, used to do video performance art on that. And I think that part of me actually, see, I'm trying to figure out what is the truth about me? Am I kind of mentally ill? Because I do worry a lot and I'm insecure, and yet I'm a talented artist. I'm an intelligent human being. I love plants and animals. I like recording my voice. Uh, I'm a little bit sad that I'm not at the Artist Trust event tonight. Uh, I I have, I spend a lot of time worrying about my schedule. I have a calendar that I made with my artwork, uh, again, with blurb.com, the same um, place that I've self-published my book, Art, Identity, and the Sacred. And I make this cool calendar every year for myself, paper calendar, so that I can write down my very complicated schedule, which is that I model at two different medical schools and probably about 10 different art schools, like all the community colleges in the Seattle area and different fine art schools all over and then private drawing and painting groups around town. And so my schedule is very complicated. I'm self-employed full time for the last, um, gosh, since uh, for 24 years I've been modeling, but for for since 1997, which is I think uh, 19 years, I've been exclusively just freelance full-time. So my income tax is rather complicated. I have several W-4s or W-2s or whatever you call them and a bunch of 1099s. So I have to pay taxes on all the 1099 income myself. So that's a little stressful and I, I have to do the Schedule C thingy and the thingy Mick Jagger. And so I use TurboTax, <laughs> not to bore you with details of my financial life, But let's just say that I am somebody who worries and is stressed out a lot. And I think that that does eat into my time to make art. And I love to make art and I like the freedom of not having to depend on it financially. But then I think maybe I'm selling myself short, you know, by not trying to be a more professional artist by not trying to get into fancy schmancy galleries or even just casual funky fun galleries. Uh, For many years I off and on I showed at Art Nut Terminal and right now I'm not really showing anywhere. I every once in a while have put my stuff in coffee shops and I've done open mic with my poetry and so these are the ways in which I've shared my art with people. Mostly I spend a lot of time updating my website and walking around taking photos and so basically my website is how I share my art like my sort of online art gallery is my website and again most of my time and energy goes into making money with uh, freelance work as a model and then whatever leftover energy and time I have I put into into making my art but then I think well wait a minute I don't think I want the pressure and I think that I do think of my art as something I do because I love it and it's fun and it's kind of therapeutic for me and I like the idea of inspiring other people to be creative. So I think maybe my calling might be to do what I'm doing right now which is to make money in a practical way like being a model and I might try to make money with my voice somehow doing voice work in some way looking into that. Uh, and then do my art for free, basically. So, but then some people cringe, you know, when they hear that. They think that I, you know, shouldn't give my art away for free. But the truth is, is that I have, uh, many of my photos have been published under the Creative Commons license, and I'm happy about that, that my photos are useful. So I'm just kind of rambling on about this because I'm wondering about these things right now, and I hope you're getting something out of this. 
So the other thing I wanted to talk about is healthcare and how I think it should be nonprofit and a public service, as well as the Section 8 voucher that I now have and that my rent is now only a third of my income, which is absolutely wonderful and I am so grateful. Somebody has criticized me for um, one of my online social media acquaintances, a fellow artist, female, somebody uh, that I know a little bit, I don't know her very well, she had a critical response to me sharing about being happy and excited and grateful and sort of wanting to celebrate that I got a Section 8 voucher and that my landlord is on board with me continuing to live here because I didn't want to move and I'm able to stay in my current apartment with my Section 8 voucher and my rent is going down. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, about being criticized for that and that about how some people... I mean, it's fine if you disagree with me on this, but if some people have an attitude that if you uh, get help in this way with a federal program such as Section 8, that you are draining the system and that you are lazy or, you know, you are uh, not working hard for, you know, what you're getting and that you are draining someone else's pockets. And I wanted to talk about the flip side of that, which is I care about ethics and economic justice. And what really, really, really upsets me about capitalism in the United States of America is that there are people who hoard money and that there are wealthy corporations who find loopholes and avoid paying taxes. And then there are people who like Walmart and companies like that, who the CEO and the upper management make a lot of money and Walmart itself makes a lot of profit and other corporations like that. And then they pay their workers like seven, eight, ten bucks an hour, which is not enough to live on. So basically, especially if your rent is really high. So like low income people like me, are helped tremendously by a Section 8 program because my rent was 950 and now it's going to be 550. My income is only about 1500 a month on average. So most of my money was going to my rent and I don't even know how I was surviving. I was paying all my other bills somehow and I uh, I go to the food bank, I go to thrift stores. I I drink a lot of water. I don't I basically don't buy coffee out. I just make my own coffee at home. I shop at Costco. You know, I get really good deals. I know how to shop real thrifty. I know how to live really cheap. Most of my money was going to my rent. And I managed to go to Europe because I have friends I can stay with who invite me and then I eat out of grocery stores very cheap and I drink water and I just live real cheap. So I managed to travel, find amazing deals on airline tickets or have people donate frequent flyer miles. I know I probably sound like somebody who's a moocher, but this is how I survive. And so I feel like like the Amanda Palmer book, The Art of Asking. I do feel like if you want something in the world, you can work hard and get it and you can also ask for help. And you can also give help to other people. Today, I gave a homeless person a piece of food. I had um, like a meat stick snack. And I gave it to this Indian woman on the side of the freeway who looked kind of cold and sad. And I think she was happy that I gave it to her. And then she complimented me on my colorful hat. And I gave I gave somebody else, some somebody on the side of the road to another another snack a couple weeks ago and it just felt good to do that and I also buy the homeless newspaper Real Change here in Seattle. I try to help out in those ways and I've donated to GoFundMes for people having medical issues and another thing is health care. It is very sad that in the United States there's price gouging in, in medicine and big pharma jacks the prices way up In other countries like the UK, the UK government does not allow pharmaceutical companies to charge like $300 for the same medication that will cost like $100 or $50 or even $20 in another country. So the thing about the United States is that we spend more on healthcare already than other countries and we don't cover everyone. So to me, that proves that it's very, very expensive and it doesn't need to be. When they say the rising cost of healthcare, 
Some people think poor and sick people make it more expensive for the rest of us. I don't agree with that. Same thing with public housing. I feel like our taxes should go towards a non-profit, like we have public schools, and we have the public library, and we have public roads, and we have, like we all chip in and we help pay for things that society benefits from, like socialized democracy. Democratic socialism basically is my favorite thing, mixed with a little bit of capitalism. So if the U.S. government would do the right thing and step in and say, hey, big pharma, you're not allowed to price gouge, that's illegal, and regulate the prices and have motivating factors to keep prices down, keep the cost of health care down, I think that capitalism and medical treatment should not mix. You know, the United States, I think, is one of the only countries where if you have cancer and you need chemotherapy and you don't have the right kind of insurance, you have to do a fundraiser and raise like fifty, hundred, hundred thousand dollars just to pay for your cancer treatment. And that is unheard of in places like Canada and England and Norway and Scotland and France and probably Australia and even Cuba. So many, many countries provide health care for their citizens at little or no cost to the citizen aside from paying taxes. And by the same token, I think that homeless people and people that are unemployed should also be able to go to the doctor and not worry about huge medical bills. So to me, health care and medical treatment should be built into taxes and just part of a public service that humans provide each other. And I, th I feel similar about public housing. I feel like there should be more social programs that help people that are low income. Because when you have some people make $9,000 a month and some people only make $1,500 a month. And so I really don't think that market rate rent works because some people, again, make so much less money than other people. So rent should be some kind of sliding scale, 30% of your income. I don't know how that we would actually put this into place, but I do think that there should be some more of a public housing way of helping people have housing that's affordable. And I work really hard, but I'm low income. So it's kind of a stereotype that low income people are lazy. I know that I'm an example of somebody who works really hard, sometimes seven days a week. I'm on call. Sometimes I work three different art schools in one day. Sometimes I do 14 hour days. I actually enjoy working, but sometimes I overdo it and I exhaust myself. I basically don't have much of a personal life. I do have a boyfriend, uh, but I don't really have a lot of friends. That's another thing I'm wondering. You know, am I wounded? Do I want close friends? Uh, or do I like, I think I, I think a little bit of both. I think I like a lot of solitude more than the average person. I like quiet time at home with my kitty. And I also wish I had a couple close friends. And what else? Yeah. So I've talked about healthcare, public housing. I also wish there were a lot more solar panels and it would be wonderful if, if we had more solar panels. It would be wonderful if the North Dakota pipeline would be canceled, erased. We could put a lot of people to work building solar uh, energy stations like in, in uh, Germany, which is a pretty small country compared to the United States, they put lots and lots of money into solar power and they generate a lot of solar power. And solar power is getting less expensive and they're coming out with better and better solar panels. They now have tiles that you can put on ro a roof that almost look like regular tiles and yet they're solar power. Uh, receptors or whatever you call that they generate solar power so I think we need to protect the earth I think that we need uh, renewable energy like solar to me is my favorite kind of power alternative and public more public housing public education I'm not into privatizing everything um, yeah public health care that's nonprofit another thing is that a lot of money is wasted in the United States on administrative costs and insurance policies that are wasteful and lots of extra paperwork 
And I feel like we should simplify our system. Our healthcare system could be nonprofit and public and single payer, and it could be completely separate from somebody's employment because then companies could focus on just being a company and not worry about giving their employees health insurance. And I know because then when you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. And then when you get a new job, you switch it. I mean, it's very complicated in the United States. And I know my friend in England, he has regular UK health care and something like only about 100 or $200. He makes about 2000 a month, I think, and only about one or 200 a month comes out of his paycheck for his health care. And that's just automatically deducted but it's, it's from the government, it's not from his job, it's not his employer doing that. His healthcare is just the UK public kind. And in the UK, if you don't like the public healthcare that they provide, the NHS, you can get private health insurance, but that doesn't even cost very much. I've asked and I forgot what the answer was, but it was lower than I thought. I know that some people in the United States pay several hundred dollars a month for healthcare, which is insane, and health insurance See, I don't want health insurance. I want health care. I want public health care, which is that I pay taxes and then I can go to the doctor and not worry about a big bill and lots of paperwork. And that is indeed how it works in other countries. I have a friend in Norway and I've asked her many questions about this. So it's a much uh, more simple system in these other countries and it's not tied to your employment. So if you lose your job or you get a new job, it doesn't matter, you still can have public health care. So that would actually simplify it for companies. And maybe companies could even do better financially, profit-wise, if they didn't have to worry about paying for health care for their, for their employees. So I think that it makes perfect sense to make our health care nonprofit and public and put it, build, build it into our taxes. In the United States, we could have health care for all under the public option and spend less than we're already spending. If we eliminated all the administrative wasteful costs, if we got healthcare and capitalism separate from each other, if we eliminated health insurance companies and those people could have different kinds of jobs like habit working in the public healthcare sector. So, and the US government should step into big pharma and say, you can't price gouge anymore. You know, we're the only country that price gouges and we can't do that. I mean, I looked it up and price gouging is supposed to be illegal. And yet big pharmaceutical companies are somehow allowed to jack prices up 400% suddenly. They say, oh, insulin now has to cost $600. It used to cost $150 and now it's going to be $600. I mean, if someone's life depends on insulin, that is criminal activity, if you ask me. If, if somebody has to have a lot of money just to buy insulin, that is a very inhumane system. So I really think that healthcare should be public, a public nonprofit for all, just like the public library, the public roads, the public parks. We should all chip in on our taxes and it should be a, a nonprofit streamlined, eliminate all the waste and give people health care. And we don't need hospitals with marble countertops that look like fancy hotels. You know, I've been to England and Norway and their hospitals are not very fancy looking, not very glamorous, but they're functional hospitals and clinics that serve people and don't charge tons of money. So that's kind of what I wish for healthcare. And as for public housing, I am very, very happy that I'm part of a f federal program called Section 8 Housing Voucher. My rent is now $400 less than it used to be. And this really eases up the stress that I have and the pressure on me to make lots of money because I have a tendency to work seven days a week and I've been exhausting myself. So this will give me a chance to relax a little bit and balance out my work life with my rest. So there it is. This is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Please write me with questions or comments. I haven't really gotten a lot of feedback on this show. If you're listening to, P, to me, please let me know and thank you so much. You can go to shannonkringen.com and find my email. You can email me. I haven't really gotten any email about this show, but hey, if you're listening, feel free to tell me. If not, that's okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen Radio, podcast number eight.
Okay, that little music bit right there was me playing the recorder and then adding a little echo onto that. That's like a little song that I wrote, I think when I was 11 years old. I wrote a few songs on the piano and the recorder when I was 11 and the guitar, but I never quite finished them. And now here's some more poetry for you. Kring speak, goddess Kring, Shannon Kring in poetry. Hope you're enjoying this podcast of mine, Goddess Kring podcast number eight, improv monologue about healthcare and financial economic justice type issues and some of my philosophy and how I survive in life and a little music and a little poetry for you. Thanks for tuning in. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. The ventricular force of the halcyonic Jordanic wheel of Scampi said to me yesterday as he was climbing the tree with a golden retriever, bump, bump, Ariel Waldman, Joni, 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 Casey McKinnon, Bump, Susie Blue, Ratorn, Brian Shady, most of his hair off, and then the circumference of the wheel and the goat fabric shined on as the ocean monkey moon roared down the skeleton of the sea spray and the spider plant scribbled with a sharpie marker on the couch curled up orange, gray, and white. The green sleeping bag tickled the pumpkins that were just freshly carved and the Tibetan flags blew in the wind as the birds ate the suet and the marble monkey slunker was in the corner with the gorilla and then I saw a lion jumping inside the spider plant once again into the rich fertile soil as the volcano the volcano erupted green and the ash shimmered down to the nasturtium and the daffodils and the daffodils and the dahlia and the and I painted green stripes on my face as I walked barefoot on the ocean of ocean and there was opalescent glass tubes flying in the air and then I saw through the alleyway Godzilla having lunch with Tori Amos and Mick Jagger and Neil Young. And then I saw Sasquatch himself smiling at me as he drank his dark chocolate blended balachino and he winked at me and said, Hello. Would you like to Would sit like on my lap and, and drink some tea, drink with, some with, tea me? with me? Chamomile, Chamomile is, very is very soothing, and, and the green heart and looked on, and, and, and the blue circle spun, spun the plates, the shattering them on the ground, ground. into the green, green chlorophyll-filled chlorophyll sandalwood sandal land, dotting, dotting, and trotting. And schlumping the mump, and monking the slunk, and the kalalelis were in blue once again, with the painted boot and the glitter drum, cream drum, and the tapir smiled on, willing its whistle, waking its schlanker, schlanker, schlank, and the birdhouse and the incense smoked. And smoked, and smoked, and smoked, and smoked, and smoked, and smoked in a fire. Of love and light, and the consciousness of the of the of the of the physics of the paw print and the DNA spiral by, spiraling by the siren sky, and the opal was here for you once again. Hey, that was a poem for you called Opal for You Echo by Shannon Kringen. That's me, Goddess Kring. And I hope that um, this has been interesting for you. I want to now play a little bit of improvisational piano. 
And again, my podcast number nine will be coming next week, a week from today. Today's December 8th, so a week from today will be the next one. Enjoy me improvisationally playing the piano. Here we go. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring.